the inhalation of ganja. To the contrary, people who smoke pot tend to lie down on couches and eat crackers. <laughs> <laughs> and, ah, yes, you may retort, but that's the problem. Post pot smokers lose their motivation. No, they don't. Two former dabblers in weed are now the governors, respectively, of Minnesota and New Mexico. One is the laconic, eloquent, presidential hopeful Bill Bradley. Canadian snowboarder Ross Rabagliati won an Olympic gold medal. The Grateful Dead became one of the highest grossing concert acts of all time. And everybody I've ever met who smokes pot now and then, ranging from high paid scientists to award winning winners, carry on pro forma. Pot is like alcohol. People undone by it usually are trying to undo themselves because something in their lives is too painful or too scary to confront soberly. The same is true of overeating, workaholism, abusing painkillers, and gobbling tranquilizers. This difference between self-abuse and recreational pot smoking is so widely and tacitly understood that the only people who miss the point are the pundits and experts who shout that pot is just one step down the road to heroin, crack cocaine, and death. Everybody else, including several squirming politicians, remains silent, preferring to keep the secret of how they found a babysitter last weekend and smoked pot, went bowling, and had a blast to themselves. <laughs> A few years ago, my local newspaper ran a big feature about what steps parents could take to warn their kids off pot. We're talking about baby boomers here who, according to the paper, were supposed to say to their kids, quote, I did try marijuana when I was your age, but we knew very little about drugs then, and it was an experience that I regret, end quote. Yeah, right. <laughs> like you regret the time that you smoked a bong with your first boyfriend in college during the summer of love, you stayed up all night talking about philosophy and listening to Van Morrison, and then made love in a bubble bath. Furthermore, you, <laughs> furthermore, you ruined the time that you tried honey oil on a cigarette at a King Crimson concert one beautiful night in July, and it was like the best concert you ever attended. <laughs> and that time you were on your honeymoon in Jamaica and someone offered you ganja tea and you sat on the beach in mellow bliss until the sun set. Never again, you vowed. <laughs> Either your teen is an idiot or they're going to look at you like you're one. Is it not far more credible than playing this hypocrite's game to instruct our youth 23% of whom have tried pot, according to the Parents Resource Institute for Drug Education, on wise, sparing usage. We might tell them, for instance, that hydroponic is awfully strong and too much will play havoc on their short-term memory while they're stoned, making it difficult to follow the plot of a movie or the gist of their friend's conversation. Best to go home in that case and just listen to music. We must tell them that they should never make hash brownies and leave the pan on the kitchen counter without telling anyone else. <laughs> we should prepare them for the enhancements of their perception, which will make them more appreciative of music, comedy, beautiful starry skies, and raw cookie dough, but can also enhance their self-consciousness so that they keep wondering whether they just said something stupid. <laughs> Heightened awareness cuts both ways. They need to know that. When I was 14, I was found face down in a snowbank, Blotto, on Kahlua. My best friend's dad, by my best friend's dad, he knew exactly what to do. He knew how to sober me up, and he knew how to counsel me on appropriate drinking. I learned from him, and over the next few years of trial and spectacular error, I figured out how to drink. My friend's dad had no corresponding knowledge of pot, nor did my parents. They worried, they panicked, they overreacted, they wondered what was so funny. We do have the knowledge now. We do have the knowledge now. Our kids can use it. So let's regain some credibility and stop pretending that we didn't inhale. On our panel today, we have Daryl LaMarche, 
who is the direct, U, director of U.S. programs, the Open Society Institute in New York. Lauren Siegel, director of public education and the Tsarina that you heard about earlier at the ACLU. And Chuck Blitz, who uh, told me to introduce him as a friend of Ethan Nadelman. Uh, what, what I ought to do is have Ethan come up and introduce you. No. But that, that would take a half an hour. <laughs> Chuck does everything there is to do in Santa Barbara, California. Um, and he's uh, all of these, the people on this panel, the requirement was that you had to have a teenage child now. Ooh, that's, that's how, and we're going to start with Gary LaMarche. Does it work? Yeah, we came, I only accepted the invitation to come here because I was looking forward to the introduction of Chuck Blitz. Um, but, uh, so I'm very disappointed. Um, the, uh, I don't know what, uh, what uh, possessed me to come and um, spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about my personal drug history in front of an audience of uh, a couple of hundred people, but uh, it's too late to turn back now. Um, Marsha, yes, Marsha's uh, captivating uh, sway over me. Um, I, uh, as Marsha mentioned, <coughs> I'm the director of U.S. programs at George Soros' Open Society Institute, so I'm a foundation executive in a foundation that is uh, heavily involved in efforts to promote drug policy reform. Before that, I worked at uh, Human Rights Watch and other international human rights organizations and was involved to some extent in drug policy issues there. And then for about a dozen years before that, I worked at the American Civil Liberties Union in a variety of capacities, uh, where Lauren was a colleague of mine. And as you know, the American Civil Liberties Union is also very heavily involved in drug policy matters, and I have a lot of professional experience as an advocate around drug policy reform issues. Um, but I don't plan to draw on any of that today. What I, what I told Marsha I would do, uh, and what I will do, is speak really more personally about the uh, issue of dealing with uh, drugs and your children. Um, and um, I really haven't prepared very much because I suppose you're supposed to be an expert on yourself. So uh, I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about the evolution of my own thinking and experience on this issue. Uh, now the first thing I guess I should say is that somehow or another when I was, oh, I don't know, 15 or 16, I guess, growing up in Rhode Island, going to first the Immaculate Conception School and then the uh, St. Bernard's Boys High School in Arthursville, Connecticut, uh, I found my way uh, into uh, a relationship with marijuana for a number of years uh, that um, it took a little while to take hold. Um, you know, I was one of these people who went, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't then and don't now smoke cigarettes. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. My first couple of efforts to get stoned were not very successful until brownies. And then, you know, I took off like a rocket from that point. <laughs> And, uh, and um, I was very cheap, and I am very cheap. I mean, Ethan knows that you know, I never quite have enough money to take a cab and that kind of thing. So I'm always bumming money from people who work for me. So I was never somebody who really <coughs> bought very much marijuana. Um, so I used, uh, I spoke pot a fair amount in high school. Uh, and, um, and I liked it a great deal. I enjoyed it. Uh, I don't view it in any sense as a useful mistake, any more than I view my youthful sexual experiences as a useful mistake. Uh, they're all part of the fabric of my life, uh, and I look back on it with great nostalgia, actually. Uh, so, um, let's see. So, <laughs> I went to college, and then, you know, and I bummed marijuana from friends in college. And, uh, and um, one weekend, <coughs> one weekend, a bunch of us went out to um, uh, Suffolk County to the beach. With